I should mention this is Trinity Hall, uh, which serves more or less as a gym every Wednesday night. So we had to displace the children, but uh, for a good cause. So they appreciate this uh, event. Well, we are delighted to join with the Citizens Association of Georgetown. And I, Father Kevin Gillespie, as pastor, feel very honored to welcome both the citizens and all members of this faith community and citizen community and present this evening's program featuring a presentation by the distinguished historian Carol R. Gibbs, as well as a musical presentation by students from the Duke Ellington School of Arts. <laughs> I'd like to offer just a brief prayer uh, so that we feel the spirit within us and among us. And so loving God, we ask your blessings for this evening of hope, hope for healing, hope for understanding, hope for insight into the ways as citizens of Georgetown, of this nation, that we go forward with determination and courage, but also that sense of wise justice that can understand the history and the wounds and the worries the people before us. We ask your blessings on giving us a sense of faith in the way you are moving us and guiding us. And we ask you to inspire us with joy, joy of hearing, joy of communicating, the joy of dialogue. We ask this in your name, amen. amen. Now friends, I ask Neville Waters and Monica Roche to come forward on behalf of the Citizen Association of Georgetown, after which our Master of, our, of Ceremonies, Paul Mako, will introduce this evening's performances. Monica and Neville, please come forward. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Dr. Monica Roche. And since the theme of this program tonight is the story of a proud community, I stand here proud as a fifth generation Georgetowner still living in my family house. Even with the harsh reality of racism and segregation happening in DC, the African American community in Georgetown was thriving. It was comprised of hardworking, community focused, and a proud group of religious people. Black Georgetown was just not domestic workers. We were skilled laborers, business owners, lawyers, physicians, including Dr. Dachson and Dr. Marshall, who were esteemed physicians who served the community. Churches were the foundation of the African American community. They brought folks together, not just to worship, but for social events, book discussions, reading programs, since the libraries wouldn't allow the black residents to enter. Churches led to the establishment of civic organizations focused on improving the neighborhood. Catholic African Americans attended Trinity for over 125 years, starting as far back as 1790 to 1920. However, they were often mistreated, not included, forced to sit in the back or sit in the balcony. So they said, you know, we've had enough. And they decided in 1923 to start their own church, which is Epiphany Catholic Church, and I'm proud to say that my great-grandfathers, with the help of the Josephite priests, started Epiphany Catholic Church, which is still going strong today. But I do want to thank Trinity Catholic Church for acknowledging all aspects of their history and for doing wonderful programs like this, where we celebrate the rich history of the African American community. I also have to thank CAG, Citizens Association, I don't know who's here. How did you move? Uh, the Citizens Association of Georgetown, um, and which is, I really encourage everyone to go on their website, cagtown.org, 
to look at all the various activities and support that they give the Georgetown community. It's been, I don't even know how many years that CAG has done wonderful programs like this every month, every year for um, African American History Month. So I thank Trinity Church and I thank the Citizens Association of Georgetown. We welcome you to come over, visit our historic landmarks that um, acknowledge our African American community and I'm just so proud to be here as a descendant of this community. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It, it's always a danger to put me in front of a microphone. I told them earlier that I had a 20-minute presentation for you tonight, and they said, well, you know, the show's not really about you. Uh, so I made, I had to throw that away. So I, I don't have any prepared remarks to say tonight, but I felt that I would be able to basically speak from my heart about um, my feelings in general. Um, I am particularly proud of the efforts of Holy Trinity. Um, I became uh, aware, and I have to acknowledge Ashley Click in particular, uh, of the efforts that uh, the church was taking to uh, reflect uh, and recall um, and rejoice in their history, uh, both the good and the bad. Um, I would encourage everyone to go to the website. My grandmother actually writes the section about uh, Epiphany Church and the breakaway from here. Uh, it's wonderful, it's touching, it's sensitive. Uh, Gertrude uh, Turner Waters uh, would be uh, quite proud of me giving her a plug this evening. So, um, but I think it's so important, the work that they're doing, because in many ways, um, the celebration of black history is simply the celebration of history. Um, the, in some ways, um, the efforts to recognize black history during this one month um, always seem to me to give the impression that, well, black history occurs during one month, and then during the 11 other months, there's another type of history. Um, and it always sort of irked me. Um, I, I look at this as an opportunity, and again, I, I go back to the efforts that, that Holy Trinity is doing with re, re, remembering the history throughout, because it is intertwined. Um, there is no history without the black people who contributed to it, uh, particularly here in Georgetown. Um, as Monica referenced, uh, we're, we're still neighbors. Um, our uh, ancestors purchased these homes. Uh, my grandfather always uh, said to me, don't sell the house, boy. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's passed away probably good 30 years ago, um, actually probably 40. Um, and uh, if you saw what the houses were going for now, uh, you said, boy, I only, I only spent $3,000. <laughs> you can sell it, no. Um, but um, the, the fact is, is I'm very proud uh, to be a resident of Georgetown. And as such, um, I must acknowledge uh, the Citizens Association of Georgetown, who also has a checkered history, but again, is doing wonderful things like encouraging this and supporting this event. So um, please do all that you can to, to support them. And lastly, I, I can't leave without mentioning uh, the cemetery work that uh, I do with Mount Zion Female Union Band Society Cemetery, uh, situated at 27th and Q, next to the Dumbarton House. We've really been um, quite pleased with the support that we've gotten locally. Certainly, we, we are looking for more. Hopefully, the city will step up here and do work with those stormwater management, which certainly has uh, impacted the environment there. But uh, please visit us at blackgeorgetown.org uh, or .com, either one. Um, it's, uh, we have some wonderful stories about people who have been interred there um, and their contributions um, to the city and Georgetown in particular. So anyway, again, blackgeorgetown.com. Um, let me get off because um, I know C.R. Gibbs is, uh, he's wonderful. He's, he's, he's uh, I'm, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time trying to convince you. Uh, he's gonna convince you himself as he tells the stories. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, Paul, all right. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much.
Thank you, Monica, uh, and, and uh, thank you, Neville. And good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Mako. I coordinate Holy Trinity's history group, and I'm also a circle keeper in our restorative justice ministry. As part of Holy Trinity's celebration of National Black History Month, we come together this evening to celebrate our community. In sharing the presentation by the renowned historian Carol Gibbs, and performances by students from the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, with the hope that when we leave, we all have come to know each other just a little bit better than when we walked in here. To that end, four years ago, our history committee came together and began to research and publish articles about slavery, racism, and segregation in our parish. To date, we've posted more than 20 articles, and our group has grown to include members of St. Augustine's Epiphany Catholic Church in Georgetown, the historian from Georgetown Visitation, and Father Ray Kemp. You might find the articles, if you're interested, on our website. At the same time, our restorative justice group undertook to confront the harm of racism through racial healing circles with members from Holy Trinity, St. Augustine's, and John Wesley AME Zion Church. Many members of those circles are here tonight. Those circles have proven powerful, personal, intense experiences for each one of us, expanding our lives our community, and our friends. We hope to grow the number of circles that are being held for racial healing. If you're interested, contact me or our social justice coordinator, Ashley Quick. But now, returning to the evening and what we have all come together to experience, I will turn you over to Lamar Fund of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. school before I introduce our first performer. Um, Duke Ellington School of the Arts is the only high school in DC that combines a full college preparatory curriculum with intensive pre-professional arts training. In one of eight majors, we have dance, instrumental, music, literary media, communications, museum studies, Tech, um, technical design and production, theater, visual arts, and our vocal music department, which we have here with us tonight. Ellington serves a diverse and talented group of students from all wards of the city. The Ellington building was renovated in 2017 and features state-of-the-art facilities to mirror the world-renowned program. I myself serve in two capacities as the Associate Director of Development as well as Museum Studies teacher. I'm also an alumni parent. My daughter graduated in 2013 through the Museum Studies program who is led by our esteemed chair, Ms. Marta Reed Stewart. We are the only um, we are the only museum studies comprehensive four-year program in the country. Wow. Shout out to Ms. Marta Reed Stewart and the vision of our founder, Peggy Cooper Capritz and Mr. Mike Malone, who had that vision to create and partner with the um, Smithsonian Institution. I have to give a special shout out to also Ms. Ayana Muhammad, who is representing for Museum Studies with me. Can you stand? It is also our 50th anniversary at um, 
Duke Ellington School of the School of the Arts, and Ms. Muhammad also represents for the National Hip Hop Museum as their curator. She did not want me to say that, but that's okay. <laughs> and um, she's been celebrating throughout the country, hailing and lauding those who have been contributing to the history of hip hop. So we're very proud of her as well. So to begin, um, to announce our first performer, we have the beautiful Sanai Nicole, who is a 16-year-old junior at, and vocalist, singer, songwriter, producer, and musician at Duke Ellington School of the Arts in the vocal music department. She has written over 30 original songs. Absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> has a beautiful operatic voice of which you'll have to stay connected with us to see our other performances where she will highlight that ability. She is also a recipient to participate in the 2023 Washington National Opera Summer Institute at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts here in our beloved Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please welcome Sanai Nicole.
so much for the beauty of your song to grab our hearts and soul and put us in the right frame of mind for our business tonight. Thank you so much. We are fortunate to have with us tonight the distinguished historian Carol R. Gibbs. Now I must say, doing a, a little bit of research of all of his accomplishments, his works, the various different forms in which he has used the gifts in his knowledge, I would take another 45 minutes just for going through his background. But I'm going to skip most of that. I will say that he is an author and co-author of at least six books, and a frequent and national and international lecturer on an array of topics. Among these books is Black, Copper, and Bright, the first book ever written on the District of Columbia's African-American Civil War Regiment. He's appeared on the History Channel, as well as French and Belgian television. He wrote researched and narrated Sketches in Color, a 13-part companion series to acclaimed PBS series, The Civil War, for the Howard University television station. 
The Smithsonian Institution's Anacostia Community Museum features Mr. Gibbs among its scholars at the museum's online academy website. He is also a DC Humanities Council scholar. In 1989, he founded the African History and Cultural Lecture Series, whose scholars continue to provide free presentations at libraries, churches, schools, and other locations around the Washington Baltimore area. The Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust has honored Mr. Gibbs for his many years of articles and presentations on African Americans in the U.S. Armed Forces. He's also a member of the Company of Military Historians. Tonight, tonight Mr. Gibbs and his presentation, Black Georgetown, the story of a proud community, will chronicle one of the district's oldest neighborhoods, leading us on a journey of heartbreak and hope, of self-reliance and resilience, and its fights to preserve its inspiring legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Carol R. Gibbs. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Pleased and honored that you could make it out today. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping details before I get started. I want to begin by just saying how wonderful it is to see so many of you after some time passed. Uh, I especially want to know Miss Larice. Uh, what can I say? Uh, you are an inspiration, walking inspiration, and on most days a percolating inspiration. You just keep going and going and going, and your your energy and enthusiasm just inject itself into me. I also want to thank Brother Man, your husband, uh, for uh, for hanging in there. Okay. Talk about quiet strength. I've learned a few things from him as well. So, um, let us go. Oh, okay. And I have to, lost my mind here for a second. Thank my wife. <laughs> or else I'd be walking home. Uh, Betty, thank you so much for accompanying me, for giving me the privilege of accompanying you to tonight's event. God bless you and, and thank you. Okay. Uh, as they say, uh, if you know when to leave, people are more likely to invite you back. So let's move very quickly through these slides and I can get out of your way. We begin. By looking at an early map of the town of George and, and having you understand. Next slide. Can you do that? Oh, wow. Fancy stuff. When we look at this church in the map in the late 1700s, we get a sense that they used to say all roads lead to Rome. Well, in this case, in this neck of the woods, all roads led to the water. And as we see the importance, next slide, of tobacco in the operation of colonial commerce, it may not look like much, but it was as efficient as you could get back uh, 300 years ago. The, the thing about these rolling roads, and these were called, these by, the means by which the tobacco was packed in these casks and a, a spoke or axle driven through these kegs of tobacco, they would then roll down specially built roads, which were always careful not to have too many hills in them, and, and brought down. If you are familiar at all with Rockville Pipe, that started life as a rolling road. If you've ever cursed the traffic on River Road, yeah, that's another one. Uh, that was a rolling road. And in places like Catonsville, they never bothered to change it. <laughs> they never bothered to change the, the name, still called Rolling Road. But the tobacco needed workers. It's a labor-intensive crop. 
And that's, in many regards, where black folk in the biggest share come in. Next slide. I like this image because for far too long, uh, people did not appreciate, in fact, did not acknowledge that black people were even in Georgetown, as hard as they that might seem to you. And you're saying as, as much attention has been given to blacks in Georgetown, that's fairly recently. I know when the creator led me to write a, a guide to Georgetown and I carried it to at least one leading citizen in this community, he said, well, th this is wonderful, but all the black history is gone. Well, that wasn't true in the early 80s when he talked to me. Okay. Uh, and it's certainly not true today. For almost every day we find more and more exciting, thrilling, tantalizing information about the African-American contributions, next slide, to, to the town of George. Tudor Place, federal style mansion, 1644, 31st Street Northwest, built in 1815, a connection to the, if you will, the first family or the first president, and yet its primary engine of labor is enslaved black folk. And, and when we look at it, her, her, we, we, we find Hannah, uh, Cole Polk, we see the South Carolina, owned by the South Carolina Congressman John Carter. She met her future husband, Alfred Polk, known figures of tremendous import in the Black Georgetown community. Both Hannah and Alfred were freed in 1850. Alfred became a, an economic superstar, a successful real estate investor, owner of a wood and coal yard. And let's not <coughs> downplay how difficult it was, next slide, in Georgetown for black people to make their way successfully, when the majority of the population was just to simply have them as workers, as commodified beings, if you will. Here's another one. Evermay, the last great Georgetown uh, mansion is on the market. I think at that time, it, the price was 49 million. This is, I think it's probably more than that right now. But let us not forget that a way of looking at it, if you come into Georgetown on the Whitehurst Freeway, um, and that's named after Captain H.C. Whitehurst of the Corps of Engineers, in case you wondered who that guy was. <laughs> the, the, uh, Georgetown, in a way, topographically and geographically, is like a layer cake. So you have the folks way down uh, uh, on, on K, and then you come up to M, and then you still have an even higher level, next slide, which was considered to be more salubrious and was originally known as, as Georgetown Heights. Georgetown Heights, that was, where, that was the best of the land. And if you are very facile and look to your top left, there's the town of George in relationship to the rest of the heart of the early district of Columbia. Jenkins Hill is going to be, of course, Capitol Hill. Uh, in, in, in my own neighborhood, uh, it was, it would come to be known as Capitol Hill, but this is even before that happened. Next slide. House in House, 34th and Prospect Streets, constructed in the late 1780s. Um, how House in House went through more how shall we say, brush-ups than uh, a Hollywood starlet. <laughs> the 800, 1800, 1807 tax assessment lists the house and land appraised at 8,000. The started property included eight enslaved people, two cows, three horses, two carriages, and many items of furniture. Next slide. It also had a convenient tunnel that went straight down to the Potomac River. There are, there's an ongoing debate today about the direct connection between Georgetown and, and the slave trade. I would simply offer for your review this item, one of two documents regarding Stephen West and Evan Shelby's business transactions. West's letter to Shelby discusses trading and supplies. He comments on the poor quality of wheat Shelby had sent him and the high cost of goods such as feathers 
that he is forwarding to show us. Let's also notice that a fresh supply of Negroes, rum, and salt will arrive at Georgetown. <laughs> but it was a slave-based society, much as ancient Greece and, and Rome, if we need to get right straight down to it. And these kinds of things, next slide, occurred all over Georgetown. And when we put that alongside the oppressive system of control that black people had to go through, I, I wanted to share this one with you. Uh, punishment for slaves bathing in certain waters. In other words, the if you ever wonder about the nettlesome relationship between black folk and the police, we need to go back to the beginning of the country. This is not a modern conundrum. It has been with us since the beginning. But as you can see, if you're going to attempt to regulate how often people can swim, <coughs> you get the idea. Next slide. And these hands, cash, 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 and Negroes want it. The subscriber will give the highest price in cash for likely sound young Negro men from 16 to 25 years, provided they can be had in time to be put on board the Steamboat Potomac on next Wednesday evening. The subscriber can be seen at Hannah's Tavern, High Street, Georgetown, D.C. This is September 30th, and it was inserted in the congressional record about 1829 or 1830. Next slide. But there were also acts of resistance that don't seem to make it into the history books. For some of the children that I encounter in the schools, they know that black people pray. We, they, they know that we implored our ancestors and almighty God to help us out of this. But what they're looking for, dear friends, is did we put it all on the line? And the answer is yes, we did that too. Um, I submit for your inspection this item, because you won't find it in most books about the history of Georgetown. These are letters from uh, describing an attempted slave uprising in Georgetown, 1802, from John Barnes to Thomas Jefferson. And uh, in the James Madison papers, this is a, an abortive slave uprising in 1802 that for some reason just seemed to never, I read one or two books on Georgetown, and it just never seemed to get told that that story still isn't when it comes just to this area, some of us are aware of the Nat Turner Rebellion. Some of us know about Denmark Vesey or about Gabriel in Richmond. We don't have to go that far to show that our children were willing to risk everything to put their life on the line for their freedom. Next slide. <coughs> William Slade Penn was on the island in Southwest, and this is a, a story of slave trade in Georgetown. Now, I know when I was putting my part of Black Georgetown River together, there were people who did not wish us to talk about it. That impolite company, how dare you? What would give you a reason to upend or tear open this gaping sore in the history of such a genteel community? But I was simply raised with the proposition that Truth is the best medicine. We used to say laughter is the best medicine. Well, truth is not bad either. Next slide. <laughs> there was someone who I won't mention, I don't think he's employed by the city anymore, who refused to simply help me out, but luckily I was already collecting information on the black experience in Georgetown. And again, as I say, I don't know what led the creator to say, listen, I want you to come up with a, a walking history of Georgetown way before such things became fashionable. But I did, and as I say, I carried it to one of the leading lights in Georgetown at the time, and he said, well, that would be great if any was left. But we know that's not true. Again, it wasn't true then, not true now. But we see along with two horses, two milch cows, also without reserve or restriction, 
eight valuable slaves, namely two young men, one valuable female house servant, an excellent cook, and her five children, all uncommonly likely. What does that mean? It means they were easy on the eyes. It means that they were pleasant uh, to the visual apprehension. I hold this out for you because I can no longer be certain, dear friends, that your children or your grandchildren will be able to look at these kinds of historical items. We have a countercurrent in American education and politics these days that says we don't need to know that, that somehow or another we're going down the wrong path. But again, truth is the best medicine. Next slide. There were celebrities that came. We had celebrities that were already here, but there were celebrities that came and visited. And in one of the newspapers, um, Benjamin Banneker was called Ellicott's Ethiopian assistant. And I like it, like it. But in any event, his very presence here, from the times that he came to the taverns to eat, to the work he did at Jones Point when he did his own observations, stared in the face of some famous people. And he had an interesting exchange of ideas with no less than Thomas Jefferson. He would understand that to tell a, a, a people that they have no value to, in his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, claim terrible things about black women and orangutans. I know you won't believe me, but you can look it up. Thomas Jefferson, Notes on the State of Virginia, it's about Article 14 or 15. And it was covered over with a patina of, we call today scientific races, which allowed very ill and sick people to just write about anything, even if they could not prove it. Because I have no idea how you would prove anything about relations between human beings and a right. But such was what Mr. Jefferson put in Notes of the State of Virginia. But one man that wasn't drinking that kind of cooling was Benjamin, <laughs> a son of Africa, a mathematical genius, a man whose own being testified to the fact that we all are possessed with some sort of human ingenuity. Next slide. I hope it's still up there. If, if ever you should be heading up to New York, and perhaps if you heard of, I think it's Maryland House, uh, it's way up on the wall, and if you look around past the elevator shaft, you'll see at least a portion of this image in color. Next slide. And we come now to Georgetown College, which operated on the slave trade for way too long, but we understand what happened and the selling of 272 individuals, it, it does make you wonder, dear friends, how people who say that we are all God's children were so readily inclined to part with them in search of profit. It does make you wonder. But this place and some of the buildings we now believe they slide on campus were probably built by enslaved individuals. What we do know is that a kind of finance using the human bodies of enslaved people helped to pay for tuition at Georgetown. And many years ago, I, I talked about this, and a student went to the Lauderdale Library and, and found this wonderful illustration. A former student, Georgetown student, Ignatius Smith, sold his slave, not the Negro, in exchange for his college tuition, the ledger shows Nat's value was equal to 17 shillings. Next slide. But the Jesuits had a system, had a web of slave plantations stretched between Southern Maryland and a good part of, of, its, of territory north of Washington, D.C. So this is a map of the Jesuit missions, 17th to the 19th century. Next slide. And thank goodness we know what happened 
in many of these places. We know, for example, that 1791, uh, an enslaved black woman um, was purchased for 143 pounds of pork and about $30. The, what you see here is just some of the daily correspondence between the priests and the Francis Neal, in this case, from Port Tobacco, and they were usually writing to the head of the Jesuit Order in the United States. Some people call him Father Z or Father D. Next slide. And then comes the Bill of Sale for Negroes of the Maryland Mission. Money was tight. Something had to be done. And it was the sale of these people that gave new life to the college of Georgetown. And here are their attempts at trying to protect their people. In, in other words, if you look at uh, they're demanding that the people that bought them in Louisiana, they may have the free exercise of Catholic religion and the opportunity of practicing them. That they are not to be sold except to proprietors of plantations so that the purchasers may not separate them indiscriminately and sell them. You don't look old enough, but, but for some of us, we remember this, this widely sold preparation called invisible ink. And it, it, you know, as soon as you write it down, it, it's just gone. The, the, the people purchasing these people were not interested in the good notions that the Jesuits had. That that was not. This was going to be a business transaction all the way down. Next slide. And of course, that would ultimately lead to a burning question: What do we do? What is right and just? to the descendants of these people that helped to save Georgetown. Next slide. And that extended to a battle off the campus. Even in what today is downtown Bowie, Maryland, there were people in the Sacred Heart Parish that wanted to get away. And if you have Sacred Heart Church and still there, and it was the scene of so many battles, <coughs> oftentimes between the black family and the queen and various priests that wanted them to stay where they were. The queen's family wasn't happy. Next slide. But today, we get a chance to see that the dream and the hopes of at least some of the black folk who knew what this college was capable of and wanted very much to steer it toward their project. Next slide. This is what they were chance to see. It was not an easy process. It took time. Next slide. But it did happen. How do we know so much about early Georgetown? Well, one of the ways is to look at the newspapers of the time. $40 reward for Negro Isaac, who ran away, uh, or, or for sale, a family of Negroes. You get the idea. Next slide. We get an even closer sense of the tremendous suffering that enslavement caused if we take a look at portraiture of domestic slavery in the United States and Jesse Torrey, an abolitionist, talks about how in this particular book, a young black woman attempted to end her time as an enslaved person. So she tried to, while in a carriage, cut her own throat. Um, <coughs> there are too many times in black history where we see the, the saying, give me liberty or give me death. Well, it might have been nice in comfort and slave made ease that Patrick Henry could say it, but the black experience in too many times personifies that love of liberty. Next slide, and the ability to risk everything, everything for one moment of freedom. I was telling Bob Kemp that uh, I will be, provided I don't wind up on the cutting room floor, 
the, I'll be appearing in a PBS documentary to be released, to be released later this year uh, on the Muslim presence in America. And they asked me to, to speak about Yaro Mahmoud, an African Muslim who lived in Georgetown, 3330 Death Place, and whose course was painted by Charles Wilson and Mr. Simpson, a local. Next slide. And in those days, his home was up this way, on the northern end, next slide, of uh, what is now Wisconsin Avenue. But make no mistake, dear friends, Georgetown's existence, it was a difficult and violent existence. I give you now a letter, first of all, uh, witnessed by Jacob Dunham, master of the ship Cyrus of New York. The following letter was sent by Captain Jacob Dunning of New York to a slave owner in Georgetown, D.C., more than 20 years ago, passing your house yesterday, I beheld a scene of cruelty. Seldom witness that was a brutal chastisement of your Negro girl, <laughs> lashed to a ladder and beaten in an inhuman manner, too bad to describe. My blood chills while I contemplate the subject. This has led me to investigate your character from your neighbors, who informed me that you have caused the death of one Negro man whom you struck with a sledge for some trivial fault, that you have beaten another black girl with such severity that the splinters remain in her back for some weeks after you sold her and many other acts of barbarity too lengthy to enumerate. And to my great surprise, I find you are a professor of the Christian religion. I don't need to add anything to that. Next slide. <laughs> The Corporation of Georgetown sought to control the everyday access of its streets for black people. So there were punishment of slaves for fighting, cons punishment for colored persons for driving horse or carriage over the paved footways of Georgetown, for shooting firearms, for selling on the Sabbath, and seven or more of us could not gather on the street, next slide, in Georgetown come down to churches, where for many members of the clergy, they wanted to have us. We, 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 we were told we were members of the body of Christ, but we couldn't sit anywhere we wanted to in God's house. We could not equally enjoy the munificence of the, the word of God. It's hard to do if you're sitting in a side gallery if you come in through a separate entrance, you already know, despite disputations to the contrary, that maybe everything is not equal, fair, and reasonable. Next slide. And never, never forget your past. You had to carry that with you as though your life depended on it because it oftentimes did. You had to carry that past. Uh, the people over the years have said, well, it's probably like getting a driver's license. Just going down to City Hall and cut you a double cop. No, it didn't work that way either. If you lost this, this is your passport to at least a measure of security. Because you would be arrested, you would be sold, advertised within the jail piece, and, or then sold. You say, well, what if you were free black and you're kidnapped? Won't somebody come get you? No, because you could be sold to pay the jail fees. It was an unfair system, a dangerous one, and one that for you skeptics, if you look at, of all people, Charles Dickens, in his book, American Notes, he talks about how horrified he is of finding that that practice went on in the streets of the nation's capital. Next slide. And so the issue of the Pearl, the largest mass escape attempt by water in the history of the Underground Railroad, occurred here. Where when I first started in this business, I was told there was really not much need to study slavery in the district because 
folk had it so easy. But I, I was reminded of what Frederick Douglass had to say about it because he, he, he said, slave, enslaved people with a harsh master wish to have a kind master. And those with a kind master wish to be their own. Next slide. Selling children by the pound in Mississippi. Publisher of the events of Hater, threatening people who, next slide, would often seek to operate the Underground Railroad in DC. And DC was in fact the terminal lay of at least one part. On at least one occasion, American forces operated directly against slaves rather than against the British invaders. In the fall of 1814, upon learning that British arms had fallen into the hands of blacks in Georgetown and Washington, General Tobias from Stansbury ordered troops to move against them for fear they would insult the females and complete the work of destruction commenced by the enemy. Next slide. And the Again, Underground Railroad. I, I love to collect these whenever I can. This is from the National Intelligence, sir. March 28, 1820. Eloped, love the use of that word, uh, from the subscriber living in Georgetown, D.C. on Saturday the 19th instant, a Negro man called Jerry. He is about 21 years old, five feet eight or nine inches high, a little bow-legged, has a scar on his head as he goes on to describe him. What we cannot be unaware of is the distance that he would believe to have be covered. Next slide. And that even included a runaway from Georgetown College. On Saturday night, the 29th instant, a Negro man named Isaac. But I'll, I'll take the suspense out of it. Ultimately, Isaac was captured. Next slide. And return to enslavement. Ran away from the subscriber sometime in the month of July last a Negro man named Remus. About 25 years of age, well made. His left foot turns outwardly from having been afflicted with the rheumatism when he was a boy. He procured free papers and will attempt to pass as a free man and make his way onward to the north. Or he may be in Washington or at work on the CNO Canal. Next slide. And again, two of the primary people in the Pearl Affair, April 1848, the largest mass escape attempt by water in the history of the Underground Railroad. Next slide. Leaving from the DC water, going down to the Chesapeake Bay. But the ship come, becomes becalmed at Cornfield Harbor, and the good folks in Georgetown, not willing to leave it to a sailing ship, they dispatch a steamship after their people. On that April, 1848, we can only speculate. We know that, that the slave owners knew something was up, because that morning, when they woke up, they didn't smell biscuits, bacon in the oven. They did not smell a, a bacon fry. The little boy who may have served as a foot warmer during the night was not there. 77 people risked everything they had. And Douglas tells us that that was part of what taking off on the Underground Railroad was actually about. You risked what you knew for what you didn't know. <laughs> what kind of courage must that have taken? When the very worst punishments have been hurled at you time and time again. But you took that chance anyway. Next slide. And then there were people who did not wish to talk about the Pearl Affair. Next slide. This is one, one of the political class of individuals. Here's another one. <clears throat> And, and notice how it begins. It is well known to you that events have transpired within the last few days, deeply affecting the peace and character of our community. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's so horrible that if you speak of it, it will you'll give life to it. Next slide. 
Next time. <coughs> but we were able to find actual accounts of people escaping on the Underground Railroad from Georgetown. We have Rebecca Jackson, a woman of about 37 years of age, of a yellow color and a bright intellect, prepossessing in her manners. She pined in bondage in Georgetown under Miss Margaret Dick, a lady of wealth and far advanced in life, a firm believer in slavery and the Presbyterian Church, which she was. <laughs> Next slide. What comes down the great eruption between North and South, when the, uh, while other people said it could just be mitigated, it could somehow be arranged so that the country would not come to battle. There were other people who knew much better. Next slide. We know that there were students at Georgetown in regular communication with rebel forces across the Potomac. And this is what they're sending signals across the Potomac so that their rebel friends in Butternut or Gray are kept apprised of what's going on in the city. This is, this, by the way, the, the title of the book, A Boy Spy in Dixie, Service Under the Shadow of the Hangman's Noose. <laughs> signals were being made from the dormitory of Georgetown College to the rebel outposts at night. Next slide. <laughs> These are other stories of the secessionists in Georgetown. There were people who believed that the majority of residents in the town of George, next slide, had, were leaning in the southerly direction. But then on that great day, April 16, 1862, slavery ends in the nation's capital, and by doing so, rings a death knell for this evil institution for the rest of the country. No matter how badly other people did not wish to see it, it was on the way. Most people could see in them, faith or form, that if it died in the nation's capital, it could not long live in the other states. Next slide. But we go to a side street off of 28th and O. This was the incubator, if you will, of Ebenezer Church. You know it today, Christ the King, but oh, dear friends, next slide. And of course, they moved into the suburbs, and they have a vibrant, huge church in suburban Maryland today. But on that day, on that very special, great getting up morning, the genius, Daniel A. Payne, spoke these words. Welcome to the ransom for duties of the covenant inhabitants of the Dick District of Columbia. And he's talking about the black community preparing to be completely free. Next slide. And because DC is the only instance of compensated emancipation in the history of the United States. It's one of, of, of many firsts that D.C. has, and Georgetown has in particular. We sometimes forget that Georgetown was here before the United States. That Georgetown was here before there was a District of Columbia. We sometimes forget that. And wouldn't you know it, that the first man in line for compensation was a slave owner from Georgetown. <laughs> His name was John Harry, who played, paid the 17 enslaved people who were all present and were examined as to age, health, business capacity. And they were then evaluated by a Negro trader who was brought in from Baltimore. Next time. And the Sisters of the Visitation Convent were slave owners and they were compensated as well. Next slide. Other testaments to escaping from slavery in Georgetown. Next slide. The celebration of emancipation in Georgetown in the years after the end of the Civil War. Next slide. Next slide. 
Next slide. Events of haste is going to come. There will be black men from Georgetown who will serve in the United States Colored Troops and the Union Navy. And the Union Navy. Next slide. This is part of the recruitment, next slide, that occurred in Georgetown and in the District of Columbia. Next slide. Across from Georgetown in the back, the black troops for the district would, would be put on what we call today Theodore Roosevelt Island to train. Next slide. Next slide. It was difficult. These black soldiers were always under threat of assault. Even their line of march here, we used to call it the FM, I believe, 22 5, the, the manual of marching. They put a Jim Crow cover on it, but we knew that black troops didn't march any differently in the Union than white troops. Next one. A shot of the 1st Regiment from the district. Next slide. Men of Georgetown in there. And of course, the black population of Georgetown grew. Next slide. After the Civil War. Coming in to the city. Next slide. There would be an indelible contribution. There would be a branch of the Freedmen's Bank in Georgetown. And there would be information. Next slide. On how many black folks now free were eager to participate as soon as they could in one of the first elections south on the Basin Dixon line in Georgetown and in Washington, D.C. Next slide. Next slide. The election was held in Georgetown, D.C., one of the first in the nation, and the first uh, white politician to make advantage of us was a man named George. D. Welch, who died, next slide, in 1902. Next slide. So we have the growth of a free black community, a free black and proud community. They have, next slide, served and survived the vicissitudes of enslavement. They are now, by 1870, part of the 11,000. 384 citizens of, of Georgetown. Next slide. And even though sometimes their living conditions, next slide, were precarious, they kept at it. They took care of other people's children. They became doctors, next slide, pharmacists, and of course business persons. Next slide. We're almost done. The idea of the census, we have this wonderful thing, but we, we can tell from looking at the census that there were parts of Georgetown, when they say Georgetown was all black, that's not what we found. What we did find was that there were communities within Georgetown, which it would be unusual uh, 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 to see blacks and whites. <coughs> It remained fundamentally segregated, even if it was in some of the elder city a checkerboard pattern. But black folk were moving up. These are black business people who were, in addition to being laborers, they were plasters, plasterers, and hucksters. They kept that slide, they kept trying. They kept putting it out here. Not from we had the old town George, old town Georgetown residents. <laughs> with the Georgetown Theater Works. That was one time operated uh, by C.B. Hunter, a dealer in poultry and game. Next slide. L. Jefferson, Mr. C.B. Hunter, next slide, a successful dealer in fresh meat, and of course, in the churches, as well as outside. Black women were the backbone of the community. Next slide. There was an unusual organization. The Supreme Camp of the American Woodman was a national fraternal organization and mutual benefit society formed by African Americans in Denver, Colorado in 1910. And yes, they had a branch in Georgetown. 
Next slide. Nobody can stop it. <laughs> and of course, once again, the church is first Baptist. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Many of the leaders of the churches, black churches in Georgetown, became leaders across the city. Next slide. How do we know this? Because we have a wonderful track of their papers, of their doings in the papers. And of course, we can't begin to close out without touching on Mount Zion Cemetery, the Old Methodist Burying Ground, and the Female Union Band Cemetery. Next slide. Which we believe is a stop on the Underground Railroad. People like Uncle Charles Turner, the mayor of Georgetown. Next slide. One of the illustrious lights, we have the vault, which we believe also was used to house freedom seekers, next slide, before they were <coughs> shipped down to the river. So what we've done then, dear friends, next slide, is to take a look at the town of George and those communities connected to it, next slide, is a, um, and we Take a look at the postcard for Georgetown University, 1920s, and we find that the, at the team prepared for the Olympics, next slide, there were black men who helped to do that. We find that the faculty of Howard University contained people who were also teaching medicine at Georgetown until the word got out that they were teaching at Howard as well. Next slide. They were dismissed from their job. Patrick Healy, don't have to say anything about him. Not in this audience. Next slide. <laughs> but how about Mace Montgomery and the groundskeeper Theodore Woodward, Georgetown University. Montgomery, who worked with the white track and field athletes at the school, accompanied the 1900 Olympic delegation. <laughs> Dr. Collins, Martin Cruiser, with degrees in what we call pharmacology and being a doctor, next slide, buried in Mount Zion Cemetery, but will be difficult for black students, next slide, who, if they got a chance, might never get a chance to fully flesh out their academic career because there were colleges who didn't wish to play other colleges that had black people on their team, if you can believe that. Next slide. Next slide. Again, examples of that slow climb toward posterity. 32 men from Georgetown helped to serve in the Spanish-American War. Next slide. People were often proudest of professional men and women in the community teachers, pharmacists, doctors. Next slide. Next slide. Such as C. Herbert Marshall. Connected to the Jennings family. Next slide. One of the earliest backstairs at the White House with Randall. The thrift shop. I mean, if you have walked past that and did not know it was built by a black brick maker. Next slide. Next slide. But Georgetown slave passed, next slide, it was found to be a little bit too rough. And while black folk continue to <coughs> have their fraternal organizations, next slide, and their, one example, the Georgetown Athletics, next slide, there were people who no longer wish to. Hugh Butler, Evelyn Lassery, 1938 in the wedding, in Georgetown, next slide. And of course, the Venus and Serena of Georgetown. <laughs> Big P and Little P, or P and Three P. Next slide. But now Georgetown is slipping into a sort of lassitude where, next slide, appear to be able to do so little. We are challenged today, dear friends, by that question in this community. But the good news is, is that for many of you, you've taken a first step. You're getting to know your neighbors. You're getting to put a down payment on generations to come to have a more amenable 
and family-oriented environment. And I thank you very much for it. Free African Americans during that period of time. Um, I'm happy to show this weekend with some of my documents at the Pentworth Library, but I want to expand um, and capture photos of landmarks and things like that that may have been associated with free blacks. And I was wondering, is there anything in the Georgetown area that's still standing that you could recommend? Obviously, an, an easy answer are the churches. Uh, we, we begin there because that is the last remaining substantial, for the most part, not exclusively, uh, but it presents itself as physical evidence of our presence, and in most cases goes back pre-freedom and comes all the way down to today. So I would, re I would recommend that as your best and most tangible uh, display of the kind of history that, that motivates you. Anyone else? <laughs> Gaskins Mitchell says that she and she cited in the documentary Black Georgetown Remembered, and she is mentioned in the book uh, Black Georgetown Remembered, says that she was sitting on, I think it's a streetcar, and she overheard two white real estate agents say, We're going to move them out of Georgetown. Now, that would be by any means necessary by a time clock that was only limited by how fast they could move and those people who had the least economic means to stay. So the, the, that's what guided it in the main. Um, and it still happens in too many parts of DC today. Good evening. Uh, Frederick Douglass once said, if there was no struggle, there would be no progress. And uh, yes, and we, we struggle, but we have progress. I, I like your display of showing uh, where we've been and, and, and pretty much where we uh, have gone. And uh, we're still fighting. Still uh, fighting. Uh, but I, I would just like to share, I would just ask you, because I'm real familiar with a, a young man they call Sai. Josiah Henson. Josiah Henson traveled that road. What's, what's the name of that road you call? Oh, the Rolling Road to yeah. sell his wares, to yeah. sell his, the, the proceeds from John Riley's plantation in Washington, D.C. So uh, I, I'm sure it was close to Georgetown where he, where he was selling. Uh, Just on the other side. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was my honor to, to do a program from the remains of the Riley Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I remember just, just one thing about Josiah Henson. You, you may know he was a model for Uncle Tom and that, that sort of thing. Or at least some people see the alleged model since he was not like that in real life. But he stepped into a battle to protect his owner from being beaten. And as a result of that, Josiah Henson um, could not straighten up and take his own hat off. If he wanted to do something so simple, something that we would not think of, he had to literally bend over until his hat fell off of his head. He was beaten so bad. I just, I, I think about that because uh, we will never know fully about the difficulties 
of just trying to survive in such a hostile environment. And I can, I can only say that I'm honored to be able to share with you some of the history that I picked up on the way. Um, I think I heard someone over here that I'm sure they'll be happy. Right here. Here. Okay, yes. Which means in Swahili, what is the news? You have given us the news of the people tonight. And as an African griot, it was historical in the African community, in the motherland, that someone told the history of the ancestors. Oh, that's okay, I think everyone can. Someone told the history of the ancestors. And I am giving a reflection of thank you from the community, from our people, Habari Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is the last one. Thank you very much for your presentation. Can someone speak to the issue of black history being taught in the DC public school system, Project 1619, all the truths that have come out for that? Does anyone know if that is still present in the DC school system? You, you've asked a, a problematic question. Um, yes, I did. It, it's, it's almost down to, do individual teachers have the courage and the resources to teach this history without getting backlash? There's a case in South Carolina right now in, in which people are holding on for dear life just for exposing their children to a book by Tana Hesse Coates, and he's writing about his son. I, I'm not quite sure how that particular book, The World and I, I, I think it's the name of it, or something like that. It, but that's that's where we are. The, the immediate ground is more dangerous than it was five or 10 years ago. I testified in front of the school board, um, but the teachers themselves, they're not immune to the vagaries of teaching life today. And we will have to remain, the, the true solution, in my judgment, is that the parents are going to have to pick up even a bigger share, the churches are going to have to pick up a bigger share of teaching this next generation of black people. Okay. I think we have to go. Thank you deeply for throwing a spotlight on the history of the community we share, a spotlight that so many today would like to turn off. Thank you, and thank you for helping us, hopefully, to come more closely together tonight. I know a number of people have additional questions, but we also have to keep some discipline with our program as well, and particularly to uh, justice for the incredible entertainers we have this evening. Um, before I announce our quartet of JJAK, just want to also thank you on behalf of our visionary principal who champions for our students, Ms. Sandy Logan, who is tirelessly helping to keep us trudging, going along, and foraging in our education and the arts. We are so grateful to her. As um, now I'd like to introduce, because they have to go home, we have a long day. Do you know when it's going from 8.30 until 5 o'clock? 8.30 a.m. sharp, and school adjourns at 5 p.m. So this is an extra long night for our students, of which they're used to because they're entrepreneurs. I digress. But JJ and K, my babies, are four Duke Ellington students who are in both the sophomore and junior classes. 
and JJAK serves as the initial for their names, Javon, James, Amira, and Kendall, who are in the vocal department. Their mission is to make a joyful noise unto the Lord with a focus of touching someone, bringing them closer to God, using a four-part harmony. They are inspired by the scripture, Isaiah 12, verse 5, Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world, and they will be singing their song satisfied. Please welcome J.J. <laughs> on Friday, which is February 9th at 7 o'clock in the main sanctuary, and it is going to be illustrious. It's with our vocal department, entire vocal department of 60 students. And I do want to announce that this group was formed by Javon Skipper. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you to him. This is why we now have the quartet, JJ AK. Jesus, I 
satisfied with you. Hopefully, I think we know each other a little bit better. 